that. Um, this tonight is tonight's harm reduction webinar is a collaboration between Enlightened Mental Health and the Australian Psychedelic Society. I'm Antonika Hoberg, the Vice President of the Australian Psychedelic Society, and I'm really excited to be hosting tonight's webinar. Before we begin, in the spirit of reconciliation between the Australian Psychedelic Society acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country of the country throughout throughout Australia and their connections to the land, the sea and the community. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people today. Please feel free to acknowledge the land in which you stream this from in the chat if you know which land you are on. We're on the Ghana land. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing that in the chat. The APS is dedicated to advocating for decriminalisation of psychedelics and breaking stigmas that are associated with psychedelic use by providing education, resources and discussions around psychedelics in our Australian communities. One of the most important topics when it comes to psychedelics is uh, the experience itself, but also the preliminary experience and the after experience. Um, so when it comes to psychedelic, their use and reducing harms, not only ourselves, but others is really important. This webinar is perfect for anyone interested in the psychedelic experience, particularly anyone who's new to psychedelics and is looking to embark on their own journeys. This webinar will touch on terms such as set and setting, which refers to the importance of context when choosing to consume a psychedelic compound. Uh, psychedelics are known to enhance a person's current state of mind and amplify the stimulus from one's surroundings. This expression was designed to highlight the importance of factors that can shape a person's response to the psychedelic substances and contribute to the outcome of the experience. Tonight's session will run for approximately one hour and we are recording it so it will be made available on our YouTube channel. We ask that you keep your microphones muted throughout the whole thing in respect to what we're trying to achieve. I will now pass you over to Eternity Housen. She is the CEO and founder of Enlightened Mental Health. She founded Enlightened Mental Health in 2022. She's passionate about making meaningful contributions to the mental health landscape in Australia. And Eternity left the army to create Australia's first online practice offering psychedelic integration services. Eternity served 15 years in the Australian Defence Force, working in national security and as a reservist. Did I say that right? <laughs> reservist. I didn't. With experience in both public and private sectors, Eternity has worked on military acquisition projects and was part of the Australia's first air-to-air -air refueling capability project. With uh, community spirited at heart, Eternity founded multiple community development projects in Canberra, including Say Hello. Partnering with Lifeline, Say Hello was a uh, focused on reducing home. Uh, loneliness and improving community cohesion. The Say Hello group has been the recipient of government funding initiatives on multiple occasions. Eternity also consults for Reset Mind Sciences with Dr. Stephen Bright and Dr. Renee Harvey. Reset Mind Sciences is the first Australian company to be granted a licence to grow psilocybin containing mushrooms in Australia, which is so exciting. <laughs> Thank you for being here with us tonight and please be sure to stick around afterwards for five to ten minutes of questions at the end of the webinar. Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar. Thank you Antonika for that lovely introduction. My name is Eternity and during this evening's webinar I'll be co-presenting with Meg Wilson. Dr. Siobhan Johnson is unwell this evening so I'll be standing in for her and presenting her content in my own words. To begin, I will go through the enlightened story. And tonight we will, we will cover our services, harm reduction, the traditional use of psychedelics, erasure of significant Indigenous knowledge, inequality in research, creative self-reflection and harm minimisation, followed by some time for questions. At Enlightened Mental Health, we offer a range of services which can be broken down into typical therapy one may seek throughout the course of their life. Given my background in the military, it is important to me that we have an impact on the current and ex-serving ADF members and their families, which is why we offer our services through several different channels for ADF members and families. ADF stands for Australian Defence Force. We also offer psychedelic integration. 
Our services can be broken down into three categories, clinical psychology, clinical counselling and psychedelic integration services. While we offer psychedelic integration services or aftercare as some prefer, please note that it is not yet possible to offer psilocybin or other substances to our clients under the current scheduling rules. It is important to note that our therapists offer evidence-based services to the general community. We are, however, more than a mental health clinic. We offer a high quality service, we offer high quality services and deliver them with compassion and care. At Enlightened Mental Health, we have a diverse team consisting of people from a range of different backgrounds. My previous and current role in the military was as an intelligence analyst, and it was evident to me that a broad range of backgrounds, um, a broad range of ideas and perspectives can only come from a team with a diverse range of backgrounds and experience. That is what contributes to the success of our team. Our team is made up of therapists, receptionists, four board members and ambassadors who each play a key role to ensure the services we offer are delivered professionally with compassion to our defence, general and psychedelic aware population. Now here's on to something exciting. Our team of ambassadors will be launching an integration portal soon, which will be a members only area of our website. A lot of work and research has gone into developing original resources for the psychedelic integration portal. The Enlightened Integration Portal will include complementary resources, including uh, in mm. an introduction to integration, meditations and other resources you can use at home, including a self-reflection journal. We are pleased to be a part of the psychedelic community in Australia and hope to increase accessibility of free resources available online. We aim to offer you resources so that you can develop the tools you need to integrate at home. We will keep you up to date with the launch date via social media, so be for, sure to follow our socials and keep an eye on our website. Dr Siobhan Johnson, who's not here with us tonight but did prepare a lot of this content, is originally from Canada, where she trained as a surgical and mental health nurse and obtained a bachelor's degree in psychology with honours. In 2016, Dr Johnson was awarded the Flinders International Postgraduate Research Scholarship to study a doctorate degree in clinical psychology. Dr Johnson has also published case reports of individuals who reported to have benefit, benefited from their use of psychedelics, and she also developed a protocol for psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. She is a very busy lady. Dr. Johnson has extensive experience working with diverse mental health populations and is a strong advocate for the dissemination of education surrounding the safe use of psychedelics. Meg Wilson, who you'll be hearing from tonight, was originally born in the United States and migrated to Australia in 2008 to begin studying at Monash University, where she completed a bachelor's degree of visual and contemporary art with a special interest in change. In 2016, Meg graduated from La Trobe University with a Master's of Art Psychotherapy and began a four-year stint as a group therapist for adults in a psychiatric day program. There she trained as a part of a team facilitating a dialectical behavioural therapy program. It was there that she developed an interest in psychedelic-assisted therapy for treatment-resistant mental health conditions. She's also an author and advocate for inclusion of diverse cultures, race, genders, sexuality and relationship styles. Meg is passionate about providing a space for clients to make informed choices about the use of psychedelics and to feel empowered to author their own life story. And we will also be bringing on another two psychologists in the next four to six weeks, which is very exciting. Before I hand over to Meg, please be aware Enlightened Mental Health does not advocate for the recreational use of psychedelics. We do recognise and respect people's autonomy and the rich history of psychedelic use that has taken place across almost every culture in the world. It is important to be aware that psychedelics are not a panacea. While they provide hope to many, they will not provide benefits or relief for every person. We acknowledge that many people with treatment-resistant mental health concerns are using psychedelics to self-medicate and others in the community are using psychedelics recreationally. Whether the purpose is for medicinal or recreational purposes, 
we believe everyone is deserving of accurate information. Our therapists provide an opportunity for those who have had a psychedelic experience to share their experience with therapists who are non-judgmental and who can draw upon evidence-based therapeutic approaches to assist with the integration process. Please be advised that Enlightened Mental Health team cannot assist with sourcing psychedelics. If you do want to connect with us, you can follow us on social media or access our website or call the number that's displayed on the screen here. I will now hand over to Meg to acknowledge and discuss the traditional uses of psychedelics. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Eternity. Can't hear you, Meg. You can't hear me. Oh, <laughs> am I on? <laughs> I can see you talking, Meg, but I can't hear what you're saying. Uh, hold on. Uh, you're on mute now. How about now? No. Oh, oh no. What's Didn't happening? Didn't happen before. What's happening? That's interesting. You could hear me five seconds ago. Here on this we will try and make you, oh, make a co-host. There we go. We're going to make Meg a co-host so you can hear her wonderful can presentation you hear me now? this evening. Are you able to hear me now? Can you guys hear me now? Everyone can hear me? I know. Then that looks stop cash screen share, I think. Yeah. Hold on a second. We still can't hear you. Yep. Oh, you, you guys, guys can hear Meg. So what I'm hearing, I'm getting a few messages on my phone that's uh, everyone else can hear me, but you guys can't hear me. Meg. Meg. <laughs> oh, so everyone can hear me except for you. Okay, wonderful. All right. Sorry about that technical glitch. I'll pass it over to you, Meg. <laughs> okay. As long as everyone can hear me, that's all good. <laughs> No, I don't the slides. Yeah. Well, okay. So hello, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to our webinar. Um, my name is Meg, and I'm one of the clinical counselors who works at Enlightened Mental Health. Um, we would really love to begin our presentation with an acknowledgement of country, an acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of medicinal psychoactive plants in Australia and worldwide. I'd like to first begin by recognizing the traditional land on which I meet. So for me, this is the Gadigal land of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my deepest respects to the elders, both, both past, present, and to the future. So nearly everything that could possibly be understood about the relationship between psychoactive plants in Australia and the traditional custodians of the land has been lost due to the intentional erasure of Aboriginal culture at the hands of colonization. What we do know is that there are numerous psychoactive plants and fungi that existed on this land when Aboriginal people arrived 50,000 years ago and that that loss of culture and medicinal knowledge is immeasurable. The image seen here is of the Paturi bush originating in Southeast and inner regions of Australia. It has been known to reduce symptoms of fatigue and thirst, allowing for extended travel on foot across the outback. And it's also known to be a very powerful hallucinogenic. When its significance was recognized by white settlers, the bush was seized and intentionally destroyed to obtain control of both the trade and the access. Since knowledge is traditionally earned in Aboriginal culture, it can be easy to understand why we wouldn't be welcome to it, even if it still existed. Today, research and trials in the fields of psychedelic medicine are predominantly conducted in Western cultures with little to no influence from indigenous communities. There's hesitation among individuals from communities of color to take part in trials or research after being historically marginalized by prejudiced legislation masked as a war on drugs. Commitments for the future could look like using accurate language and including references to native origins of psychoactive medicine. An example of this is challenging the use of the word discovery in relation to psychoactive plants where there is a suggestion that its role in therapeutic recovery began with Western medicine. It could also look like inviting collaboration and influence of diverse philosophies, cultures, and into the evidence-based approach for psychedelic integration. 
This could look like inviting the traditional holders of belief, spirituality, and storytelling to directly contribute their knowledge to the space of qualitative research and the recovery model for mental health. Also, advocating for the overturning of laws that create biases against communities of color and designing research that actively includes a more diverse population. We hope to continue to instill anti-oppressive practices and pursue reconciliation as we grow and move forward. And now I would like to pass back to Eternity to speak on the topic of harm minimization. Thank you, Meg. There we go. I will now cover harm minimization. Harm reduction practices are crucial for anyone considering a psychedelic experience. It is important to seek the facts from one of our therapists before embarking on a psychedelic experience, especially for the first time. This will ensure you receive factual information and the risks are clearly outlined. While many psychedelics have been demonstrated to have powerful healing effects for some, these effects will not be experienced by everyone. Some people may have a healing experience, while others will experience equally destructive and undesired effects during and after a psychedelic experience. There is an increased risk of harm when using psychedelics recreationally. For example, Dr. Siobhan Johnson has worked with clients who have experienced post-traumatic symptoms, psychotic episodes, and who have hallucinogen persisting effects, or HPPD. For some individuals, hallucinations persist long after the psychedelic experience has ended. The psychedelic experience can be unpredictable and it is important to consider this. It is important to be aware of sourcing psychedelics in the community and the potential risks of accessing these substances outside of a controlled setting. MDMA and LSD can be laced with other substances. For example, street MDMA has been known to be laced with things like ketamine and methamphetamine. Sometimes 2CI, a research chemical with powerful psychedelic effects, can be used in place of LSD. Psilocybin containing mushrooms are popular in Australia and we speak with individuals who are microdosing or taking large doses very regularly. Psilocybin has demonstrated a strong safety profile in clinical research trials, meaning that they are relatively safe. However, there is an increased risk of harm when used in the community outside the context of these trials. It is always possible that someone has picked a poisonous mushroom which can lead to death. The literature shows that serotonin syndrome can occur combined with other pharmaceuticals, including herbal remedies that target serotonin. This can also occur when psilocybin is combined with antidepressants that are SSRIs. Serotonin, serotonin syndrome can be fatal. Drug interactions, outside, drug interactions are outside of our scope of practice. However, it is worth considering seeing a psychedelic aware GP, pharmacist or psychiatrist who can advise you further. Drug testing kits can be useful for substances like MDMA. Most drug te testing kits do not, use, do not include LSD, psilocybin or other classic psychedelics or research chemicals, so be mindful of this. Therefore, if a person is going to use or if you're going to use a psychedelic for safety reasons, knowing your source is crucial. Psychosis. Individuals with personal or an immediate family history of psychosis may be at an increased risk of psychedelic causing a psychotic reaction. This is something we've seen in our practice at Enlightened Mental Health and it can be a very isolating experience. If you believe you've experienced psychosis as a result of psychedelic use, please reach out to our team for support. It is important to consider set and setting. Set refers to the person's mindset prior to and during the psychedelic experience. Setting refers to the environment in which the psychedelic is taken. We do believe it is possible for an individual to heal trauma using psychedelics recreationally. There is also an increased risk of psychological harm. Psychedelics are powerful and without adequate preparation and support, going into traumatic memories while on a psychedelic may have the potential to exacerbate symptoms. 
The intensity of these feelings or experiencing trauma while on psychedelics can be incredibly intense. I would encourage anyone thinking about doing this to be mindful about where they are at psychologically. If you are planning to walk the psychedelic path, please ensure that you have adequate support systems in place, including psychedelic integration therapy sessions booked in with our therapists who can assist you to continue processing your trauma and your experience. Ideally, psychedelic integration should be done with a therapist as close to the psychedelic experience as possible or at worst within the same fortnight after your experience. Setting. It is important to consider practical safety concerns. During a psychedelic experience, it is likely you will hallucinate and perceive reality very differently. This may include experiencing colours differently, seeing patterns, shapes, beings, and experiencing time and depth differently. Perceptual distortion can pose an increased risk to individuals when used in areas where falls can happen. For example, a high-rise building, a beach with cliffs, or a balcony might not be a good idea. While many people using psychedelics, it is important to consider that your inhibitions may be lowered and you might get closer to animals you wouldn't usually approach, including snakes. Psychedelics can also alter depth perception. It is important to realise this before you embark on any long walks or decide to climb a mountain. Time distortion is also common during the psychedelic experience and it is important to consider if used outside. One may lose track of time and forget to do things like drink enough water or reapply sunscreen. Heat exhaustion and sunburn are worth considering as practical risks that are simple to reduce. It is extremely important to be mindful about the people you allow into your space. Psychedelics enhance suggestibility and render a person highly vulnerable. Ensure you feel safe with the people around you and you trust them and you can rely upon them. It is not possible to be entirely safe in a recreational setting. So if you feel in any way uncomfortable with the people you are with, as I like to say, if in doubt, sit it out. There's been a lot of news around inappropriate behaviour in recreational and clinical psychedelic settings in the US. Please be advised that inappropriate behaviour can occur anywhere and it does occur in Australia too. If you do not feel safe and you think the people you are with will not respect your physical boundaries or other boundaries, it is okay to say no, even change your mind at the last minute. Please be advised it is not appropriate for anyone, friends or guide to provide touch during a psychedelic experience, especially of a sexual nature. It is appropriate to remain dressed for the entire experience. If you are con considering taking psychedelics in a group with a lead facilitator, it is important to ensure you will not be allowed to wander on your own. To avoid an emotionally unsafe environment, ensure you are surrounded with mindful people. Surround yourself with people who are sensitive to others, who are comfortable with you moving through your trauma. It is important for those around you to learn about psychedelics and their effects on your physical body too. Being surrounded by people who know the difference between a bad trip, a panic attack, an ego dissolution and a real medical emergency could make all the difference. I will now hand back over to Meg to further discuss set and setting. Thank you, Eternity, for that. Um, Right, so to continue on the topic of set and setting, uh, I just want to use some of the knowledge that I've gained as my work as an art therapist uh, to discuss the creative and sensory elements of a therapeutic experience and how that might reduce the likelihood of you having a harmful psychedelic experience. So for individuals who are planning a psychedelic experience, there's a few considerations for the process that may increase the likelihood of the experience itself being effective for you rather than re recreational or potentially harmful. Many people report that their personal psychedelic experiences felt profound, partly due to the information they received on a sensory level. So that usually means what you see, what you hear, what you bring in on, on that kind of external level. And in the context of a safe setting for a psychedelic experience, you might find it useful to look at the five senses as a basis for deciding what stays and what goes in your environment. So 
So, you know, a, a good example of this is, um, have you ever walked past someone who was wearing a scent that suddenly took you to another place or time? If that memory brings you pleasure, you might find yourself trying to stay there a little bit longer as the smell begins to fade away. If you consider other profound moments in your own life, most of which, unlike psychedelics, are actually happening externally, like seeing your favorite artist in concert or meeting a new lover or holding your child for the first time, you might be able to name the textures and the smells and the images and the sounds and other sensory elements that contributed to that moment. And you might find yourself pulled back to that memory when you encounter any of those sensory elements later in life. This, does, this also applies to traumatic memories. I'm sure most of you may know this, which is all the more reason to consider your sensory environment carefully when you're making these decisions. Your body communicates with your mind through sensory information, and then emotions are created using your memories and experiences. And this informs how you interpret and make sense of almost anything. The triangular relationship between your senses, your emotions, and your memories means that your physical comfort and surroundings play a really important role in the safety and reduction of harm for any psychedelic experience. With that understanding, you might wish to consider the elements of a psychedelic experience where the use of intentional scents, sounds, and textures can reduce the risk of having a harmful experience and increase the possibility of having quite an effective one. So, you know, just some common items for sensory experiences, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with these things, but I think it is important for us to just kind of be able to name them, is that um, you might want to include things like candles, incense, vapor aroma, diffusers, oils, or perfumes for scent, hand lotion, a soft blanket, or maybe an object that has like close memory for you, uh, loose, comfortable clothing, clay or smooth stone for texture and touch, the sounds of waves or nature or some gentle music with a personal attachment that's particularly soothing can be quite effective as background sound. Lighting has a really big impact on our experience. And so it might be best to avoid things that are like high contrast, harsh lighting or direct sunlight for pretty obvious reasons. So, Art therapy techniques have been used effectively for the processing of trauma and to reduce the symptoms of PTSD for decades. A lot of people see art therapy as kind of a new concept, but in fact, we're talking about something that's actually quite old, as old as talk therapy. Creative processes give the opportunity to express emotions, ideas, and experiences that are difficult to describe with words. There is no experience or knowledge necessary to have a creative process. And in fact, the biggest hurdle is to let go of expectation about the value or the quality of the work and just to see the experience as more of an experiment. Interestingly, many people I've met describe feeling more uncomfortable with the idea of using art materials for self-expression than actually having their first psychedelic experience. <laughs> Says a lot about how powerful it might be. <laughs> so for the purposes of integration, after having a profound experience, much like a psychedelic experience, a creative process can help to make sense, form insight, and provide closure. Journaling is considered a helpful tool for the preparation and integration of experiences. Naming your thoughts and curiosities and fears, intentions or concerns can help you notice any themes or patterns and to place and to also have a place to reference afterwards. The before and after of a profound experience allows you to go back and revisit how you may have felt prior and reflect on any new insights or changes that you might notice within yourself. And this is really valuable information. If journaling is new to you, then you might find it helpful to choose a time where it feels easy to fit in, maybe just before bed for a couple of minutes or when you wake up. 
For visual processing, because not everybody wants to go journaling. So if you prefer visual processing, um, you might find the use of watercolors quite useful. Uh, they're very forgiving. They're easy to use. You can take them anywhere. And it's a material that allows for quite a meditative practice. It's really useful for integration. Due to the internal nature of a psychedelic experience, themes that arise may relate to your relationship with yourself, how you see yourself, how you experience the world. All of these things require maybe further reflection on your behalf, either before or after your experience. I think it's the slide before that. There we go. Thank you. Um, additionally, if there's a material you feel comfortable with, such as acrylics or clay, maybe you enjoy collage making or weaving, just to name a few, then you might find it easier to explore with these on your for your own preparation and integration. There's no right way of doing this. The creative process in and of itself is enough. A creative process is also effective as a self-soothing technique. So for moments of unease or anxiety within an experience, you might find doodling, forming a piece of clay or plasticine, creating abstract shapes with paint or arranging natural materials such as leaves or stones. These are all considered grounding techniques. If you're experiencing an altered state, you might find it useful to use your hands in a way that keep you aware of your body and connected to your external self and the world around you. So just to summarize, understanding the basics for your own physical and mental safety will greatly reduce the likelihood of having a harmful psychedelic experience. By paying attention to your own emotional responses and to the sensory elements around you, you're also going to increase the likelihood that the experience may even provide useful insight and self-learning. Considering a creative process for preparation and integration may also be helpful to contain the experience and provide you some closure afterwards. So it's our hope that this webinar has provided you with a greater understanding about the origin of psychedelics and the importance of harm minimization and some useful integration tools which are intended to facilitate the healing process. For further information about Enlighten and to access therapeutic support and resources, please visit us at our website or to contact us by phone or email. So before we move to questions, we'd like to thank the Australian Psychedelic Society, thank you, and for hosting this webinar, and to please show your support to the APS by donating to ensure that we can continue having events like this. So yeah, me and Eternity and Anamika will be taking questions for the next five or 10 minutes. Thanks so much, Meg. That was awesome. You did a great job. I really, I loved the part of that whole bit that I loved the most was using all of the different things. You were like, you know, you can just use some sticks and some rocks and ground yourself like that. And it's just little things that you just don't think about. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So do we have any questions in the chat? I will double check. I just want to mention something Meg didn't mention earlier. Was that basket that you saw up on the screen was something that Meg made herself? So she's quite yeah. talented. I thought it was just a stock picture from online, but Meg actually made that basket. Yeah. That's and she takes great photos as well. <laughs> I did a basket weaving class inside the psychiatric hospital when I was working there. I ended up teaching everybody. We all did it together. <laughs> and so that's that, that's my basket from the hospital. <laughs> so cool. So if you do have a question, please leave it either in the chat or if you really do want to ask it in person, you can, um, but leave that in the chat as well. Um, and you can just so that we know the maybe some of the content of the question in which you want to ask about. Um, but, yeah, so it's pretty much up for you. Do you have any questions while we wait for questions? I don't have no any pressure. questions. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you for hosting it. I know this is the first webinar that you've hosted yes. and you did an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. 
Oh, it doesn't seem like there's too many. But we'll get I think we might have explained everything, Meg. Maybe we've covered all of the topics. <laughs> <laughs> there's got to be something that someone wants to ask. Maybe you're not you're not game to ask in the group chat. You can send it directly to us if you want to. Ooh, there was a reading. There's a question from Din Nusha. I hope I said that right. There was a reading that DMT is produced naturally in the human brain. Is there a way to do it naturally? There's, there are some studies to say that it is produced in certain parts of the body, um, but those sorts of studies are kind of inconclusive depending on the ones that you read. I'm so sorry that people are messaging me and some other thing that keeps popping up. Um, but you can access similar altered states uh, you by doing things like breath work, uh, you know, deep meditation, that kind of thing. There's there's ways to access those states. It's not necessarily going to produce DMT in your in your brain. Uh, I don't know about the biological way that that would work. I don't know enough about DMT or the human body uh, for that to be a thing that I could give it any advice on. But you can definitely access states in which you could experience similar feelings and thoughts. We have another question that's come through as a direct message. And I think, Meg, I think you'll be um, able to answer this one really well. Uh, should there be any purpose before taking psychedelics? Should, should somebody set a purpose or an intention? Yeah, uh, that's such an interesting question. Um, I've worked with clients who have come to therapy because there's a specific aspect of them that they want to work on in therapy. And that aspect then evolves into their intention for a psychedelic experience. Um, and, and these are people who usually know the thing, you know, they know that there's this element of their childhood or that like, you know, there's, there's uh, some, some part of their personality or some kind of like incongruent thing going on. So we will, we'll evolve that into a, a purpose, but Simultaneously, I don't think it's necessary to have an effective experience because uh, there's also people who say that going into it and remaining open-minded and allowing their own body to produce something for them to know. So that's sort of like in mindfulness meditation, that idea of like waiting for the answer is also something that people simultaneously find valuable. And so I don't, I don't have a preference either way. Um, when I'm working with people, we just kind of let that emerge naturally but it's not necessary however for some people it's useful yeah awesome yeah great it's, answer it is a great answer yeah okay. any final questions yes any final questions uh we had uh kane um the aps resident mycologist comment about dmt saying it may occur in the body there's no real studies on it but it's metabolized so quickly that it would be very difficult for us to track it you know it's um, just happens it's gone and yes oh and holotropic breath work so oh. holotropic breath works is is another way to access similar states to what dmt would um would you would you would have effects of um i've experienced some of those in holotropic breath work myself we have another question that's come through from emily emily says i've heard of dmt producing smoking ceremonies being used in birth ceremonies in Indigenous cultures, do you or any of know of any other ceremonies used, or is this information not widely known? Well, it, like it's, it's okay. So the use of the word DMT when we're talking about psychedelics is kind of hard to pin down because the the DMT molecule uh, is it's often interchangeable with the same kind of word we would use for things like ayahuasca. Um, so DMT kind of occurs naturally around the planet. And so there's no one thing called DMT. Uh, it, it can be a wide variety of things and ways that people have resourced it. So when we're talking about rituals where something that's derived from a DMT molecule does occur, I'd say that that's probably one of the most widely used ritualistic hallucinogens. So you're going to see that happening everywhere from, you know, the reg regions in South America and Peru, where it's more widely and famously uh, studied, but also in Africa, there's quite a lot of um, origin for DMT plants. And so, you know, the specific rituals themselves, that again, kind of goes back to what I was describing earlier in our webinar about the kind of loss of native culture and native knowledge is that 
we simultaneously have erased it, but also nobody wants to share it with anybody who's, you know, considered a colonizer of Western medicine anymore for, for really good reason. So um, it's, that's, it's a very hard thing to say, but <laughs> I wish I could answer it more specifically for you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, it would be so interesting. I um I have I've read very small things about psychedelics and birth, um, but it's very hard to find any information on it. I just find it so fascinating because the birth in itself is such a psychedelic experience for me, anyway. <laughs> um, somebody did also ask um, Meg, you might have some advice for someone who has a uh, synthesia, which. Uh, so whether that's induced with psychedelics or whether that's just something they struggle with uh, alone, I'm not sure, but it depends on what sort of advice they were after. But do you know much about that? Sorry, what was the question again? Any advice for someone who has syn synesthesia. synesthesia? So this is... Oh, yeah. I'm a bit <laughs> people with synesthesia. <laughs> I have to admit, as an art therapist and a creative, um, synesthesia can, it's, so it's a crossing of the senses, which means you might taste words or see sounds. Um, and interestingly enough, there's an understanding that perhaps psilocybin and LSD actually produces a level of synesthesia in the body. And that's why we have the hallucinogenic response that we do. So for somebody who's already got synesthesia, God only knows what kind of experience you're going to have. If, if you find your synesthesia to be comfortable, you're okay with it, it doesn't cause you distress, then I'd say, you know, I mean, it's just as likely for you to have quite an eye-opening experience as anyone else. But most certainly, um, I would encourage you to take part in a study because they would really value your information. And two, I, I think that, um, you know, the same kind of advice that I would give anybody is the kind of advice I'd give to somebody with anesthesia. Just, you know, take care, pay attention to what you already know about yourself and, you know, that sort of thing. Good answer. I like it. Um, there's also another question. It's can we get addicted to psychedelics? Good question. Great question. I really like that question. I'll leave it with you, Meg. Yeah. So can we get addicted to psychedelics? Look, we can have unhealthy relationships with anything. You can have an unhealthy relationship with your dog or a candy bar or your car. Um, it's, it's about our nature of the relationship. And does that relationship cause you distress? Um, in the DSM, generally speaking, if the relationship you have with something is causing you distress and causing harm to, to people and, and, and that sort of thing, then um, it's probably an unhealthy relationship. But as far as a, an addictive factor, there's no known addictive nature to um, the, the predominant form of psychedelics. Um, yeah. Thanks, Meg. <laughs> Okay, and there's, do you want to do two more? Yeah, so we have another question here about recapping uh, what we said about depressive medications and psychedelics. Uh, there's no, this is outside of our scope of practice. So first we would advise that you speak to your GP, psychiatrist or pharmacist. However, there is a known interaction with psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms and SSRIs or antidepressants. And that's really all I think that we can say on that without going outside of our scope. So Meg, do you want to comment further on that? Look, um, because of the lack of research in the combination of psychedelics with almost any sort of psychotropic medication, it's, it's just a caution game right now. Until we have more prolonged research with a greater cohort that's really diverse, we're going to have a hard time knowing what that combination is. And, and my, my port of call with anybody who's on a wide variety of medications is one, be really honest with your GP. Most GPs are fine hearing this kind of information. And if your GP isn't okay hearing this information, it's time to find a new GP. Because at the end of the day, you want to be able to have an honest and open relationship with the person who's assisting you with your physical health. So I, I hate to say that we just don't have enough research to say really Absolutely. Uh, however, um, if you were to look up serotonin syndrome, I think you might uh, find what you're looking for to the person who asked the question about uh, interactions uh, with antidepressants. So just Google serotonin syndrome syndrome and see what's available online. 
Now, there was another question I wanted to answer. Someone has asked, when will the trials take place with Reset Mind Sciences? Good question. Uh, I love that question. Thank you for that one. So Reset Mind Sciences, uh, we will begin uh, growing the psilocybin-containing mushrooms in the second half of the year. And then there will be uh, quality control and testing and a number of other things that need to happen uh, before we begin uh, human trials. So I can't give you an exact date for those who are interested in potentially being involved in those trials. And I, I also can't comment on what we will specifically be testing, uh, testing it for. So stay tuned, watch this space, uh, look for updates on, on the website, social media, and uh, stay tuned, but we'll definitely keep you updated. So thank you for that question. Great question. It's very exciting. It is. Growing awesome. real in the world. Well. containing mushrooms in Australia. Yeah. Uh, Liam has also left in the chat for anyone who's interested information on SSRIs and psychedelic combinations. Uh, there's a chart there that he's put up for everyone. So check that Thanks, out. Liam. Thank you, Liam. Legend. Great. <laughs> All right. What about this one? Research on chronic pain. Ah, there is a little bit of research, I believe, on chronic pain and psychedelics. Uh, specifically, What's the question? It, well, good question. <laughs> is there much research on chronic pain and psychedelics? So I haven't read a lot of the studies that have been done, but I have heard a lot of success stories uh, anecdotally and in the research around chronic pain. But Meg, you might know more on this. Well, in, I was just having this conversation um, with Eternity, uh, I think earlier today, actually, where I was, I was kind of mentioning to her that the only experience I have with ketamine has been through uh, clients of mine receiving ketamine infusions for chronic pain. Um, so there, there is actually a pretty long, you know, I'm long in this world, you know, pretty long history of ketamine infusions being used for people who experience chronic pain and getting some pretty positive results that do last some time afterwards. Um, I've certainly had clients feedback to me about uh, their own recreational use of psychedelics and how that has relieved chronic pain of various degrees for, for them. This is purely anecdotal. This is only feedback that I've received from clients. And so I really, really, really feel enthusiastic about more research being done on um, general psychedelics and, and their impact on chronic pain. I mean, we already know that cannabis plays a really huge role in pain relief as well. So this idea that maybe altered states might have a relationship with how we interpret pain because pain is an interpretation in the brain. So if we can alter the way we interpret those signals in the brain, then there's a really good chance that, you know, pain could be become something else, at least a little bit more comfortable for people. And so, yeah, I think that's a really, really, really untapped resource for sure. It really is. I met a woman actually just the other day when I was on Insight <laughs> TV, everybody. Um, I was on Insight and she had been through one ketamine session that lasted a week and she had nine months of relief. Yeah. Nine months of That's pain exactly. relief. She was yeah. she was on opioids. She was on mm -hmm. everything, methadone even, and um, she didn't need it anymore after that. That's great because and the research amazing. Yeah, the research shows that ketamine, when used without when it's not paired with therapy, can last or be provide relief up to 28 days. But when it's paired with therapy, so psychedelic integration, it can last up to 18 months. So that's yeah. what the research is currently showing. So, um, but that's really good. And that's not for chronic pain. That is for uh, treatment-resistant depression and other, other mental health issues. Um, but for those who uh, didn't maybe hear what Antonika said, um, Antonika was on Insight. She's, the episode <laughs> yes. is going to be aired on SBS Insight on the 10th of May and you can uh, watch this lovely woman uh, speak about her own personal psychedelic experiences. So Thanks. watch this space. <laughs> uh, now we have a question for Meg as well. This is another question from Alex. Thanks, Alex. It says, Meg, I've heard people talk about a bad trip. Is there such thing as a bad trip and a good one? I love this question. I love this question. <laughs> uh, so you're going to, um, this is kind of one of those like mainstays of my therapeutic approach, but I'm, I'm not some somebody who will easily subscribe to like the goodness and badness of things. I find that there are people who go into a psychedelic experience and they come out either uh, reporting that it was difficult, terrible, scary, uh, brought up a lot of deep things. They got lost or hurt, or it was a terrible environment, like a nightclub, or, you know, they, they felt unsafe with the people around them, but all the typical things that you might subscribe to like the bad experience, 
generally relate to all the advice we've been giving in this webinar today, um, primarily for that purpose. So is there such thing as a bad experience? Well, I think that people can have a traumatic experience on psychedelics. Absolutely. Um, and so the, the, the thing that you can do best for yourself is to just take into account all of the ways that you can mitigate that in the way that you only know yourself and, and know what's safe and not safe for you. As far as a good psychedelic experience, I mean, you can say they recreationally had a wonderful time and connected with their friends and had a great dance on the dance floor and life was good. Or you could say that they went in with a therapeutic intention and came out of it learning something more deeper about themselves. But um, yeah, either way, I think it is I, rather than good or bad, I might say like effective or ineffective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's actually a really good way to go about it. Uh, personally, for me, I've used the psychedelics to heal CPTSD, uh, but each experience was very difficult, but the outcome afterwards was life-changing. And so whilst the psychedelic experience itself is very uncomfortable for me always, uh, it's the outcome and the change in perspective that enables me to view that experience, not as a bad trip, but as a challenging trip that was necessary for me to change my perspective on what I was doing or who, whatever I was going on in my life at the time. So, yeah. That's such a good point you're, you're making too, is that some of the most profound experiences of our lives are also some of the most uncomfortable ones. Exactly. Exactly. We have a lot to learn from the pain that we have to experience sometimes, yeah. even if we don't want to. <laughs> Uh, what else have we got over here? Can psychedelics help you learn self-control and control addictions? Hmm. I think that's another one for that's, you, Meg. Yeah. Can psychedelics, I'm trying to find this, the question. Can Isn't psychedelics help you learn self-control and control addictions? Oh, well, okay. So there is efficacy around psilocybin and its relationship with a uh, reduction in alcohol use. So there was a really big study. I can't name it off the top of my head, but it was only published like last year. And it, it did show that people who were engaging in a psilocybin uh, trial had fewer uh, interests, like less interested in alcohol. Um, most people just describe psychedelics as like giving them disinterest. <laughs> Yeah. It's not like I don't want it anymore. It's more like a, I just don't care anymore kind of um, kind of a description. In my own practice, clients that I've worked with, I, I certainly noticed that kind of response coming out of it. Uh, and, and who knows really what the underlying mechanism is of that. But almost certainly my clients uh, who have engaged also with mindfulness meditation practices, journaling, you know, they, they really go in in their effort. And so they... They engage fully in, in the process and a psychedelic experience is a part of that. Definitely report back a, a reduction in interest in the use of addictive behaviors. I experienced that firsthand. I um, had a psychedelic experience and gave up a 15 year alcohol habit the next day. And I haven't barely, I've, I had one relapse and I've been alcohol free for about seven years now. Um, and it was a very big problem of mine. Um, and it was, again, about changing my perspective on how I saw myself that enabled me to stop drinking because I was drinking to cover up pain. And mm. that's, what, that's, that's the tunnel we fill down. Mm -hmm. but yeah, great question. There's a question from Emily here that says, is there any progress to the decriminalization of substances such as psilocybin? I'll take that one. Yeah, That's you go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the progress varies from state to state. So, for example, in the ACT, there is a bill um, that has passed most of the way through Parliament and the bill uh, addresses decriminalising a number of substances, including uh, psilocybin, MDMA, and a range of other substances, including MDMA and heroin. Uh, now that bill has uh, been halted for a little while, so it's at a it's at a pause. And the um, I'm meeting with the minister in two weeks and a politician in Canberra in two weeks to discuss um, to discuss this and see if we can push that through. Because at Enlightened Mental Health, we do support decriminalisation, so we are. Um, focusing our efforts on trying to support that in the ACT, which could be the leading territory to which will be excellent. Uh, mm -hmm. I think one of the issues with the legislation at the moment, and I would need to look into it, so please don't quote me on this, but I do think that it would be a state legislation rather than a federal government law. So I think those two laws 
even if it's decriminalised in the territory, it still might be illegal federally. So that's something we're looking at as well. But I think for us, one of the things that we do at Enlighten and one of the things that I do in my day-to-day role is speak with uh, various politicians across Australia to really educate them about uh, psilocybin and MDMA because sometimes uh, politicians aren't aware that a lot of people are taking um, these these substances or using these medicines, how, however you want to phrase it, um, for self-healing and they're not displaying antisocial behaviour. So they're not out there stealing things, wrecking cars or graffitiing. They're at home in a nice, comfortable space, focusing on their breathing and going inwards to, to heal themselves and trauma and, and hopefully um, have a transformational experience. So decriminalisation... Uh, watch this space and there are a lot of things hopefully that will we hope that will happen in the next five years including decriminalization and potential uh, rescheduling down the track but of course we need a lot of things in place before that happens Uh, we need um, evidence-based courses we need um, trained therapists we need the legislation to line up uh, with the rescheduling so there's a lot of things uh, that need to fall into place but I think we together um the psychedelic community in australia i'm hopeful that we can make it happen what's that mm. you did it <laughs> so we have any more questions i think that's pretty much it i do want to read out kane's quote though because it's my favorite quote of all time and i love that he shared it and it's carl jung's quote to reach the heights of heaven you have to experience the depths of hell mm. and um that's very true when it comes to the psychedelic experience. Mm. Just look after yourself. That's right. I think that's all the questions, though. Yeah. So maybe we should round it off. Oh, there's one more. Oh, one more. One, we'll do one more and then that, that's all. Oh, this is a difficult question. I like this. No, this, this is, is a, good a difficult one. question. I like this question. How, many time, how much time should we give between trips? <laughs> I'm going to give my answer. <laughs> um, so... It's totally up to you as long as you are safe and comfortable. Um, I personally only use these things for healing really important things to me. Um, And so it's not a very often thing that I have to do for myself. Um, And as long as you're looking after yourself and you know yourself and you can understand and you're getting the support and therapy and integrating and using harm reduction practices, you're going to keep yourself safe. So that's that's all. That's my Unless Meg or Tony have. We'll pass over to Meg. Look, from a, just from like a um, general safety perspective, many psychedelics have a, uh, they produce an extremely high tolerance uh, from the onset. So you couldn't necessarily, let's say, um, take two doses of LSD in a 24 hour period and expect it to work. Um, So what that requires is for you to educate yourself on what safe and healthy dosage is for psychedelics. This applies to any substance you put in your body, whether it's caffeine or or acid. So um, I would say that, you know, what's a safe amount of time between psychedelic experiences is completely unique to the human being, but it's also dependent on the substance itself. So you need to know both of those things before you make that decision. Good answer. And that is something that if you're unsure about that you can discuss with one of the therapists at Enlighten who can help you explore what might might what might be appropriate for you. Mm-hmm. That's right. Happy to. <laughs> awesome. I think we're done. Well oh. done. Thank you so much no. for hosting us. No. I really appreciate it. Thanks You've been wonderful. Me. And thank you to everyone online who has uh, sat here and listened to this presentation. I really hope that it's been useful for you and you can um, use some of the the things that we've talked about. Um, And please stay tuned for our integration portal, which will be going up very early June so that you can download our free resources and integrate your psychedelic experience at home. I love that. That's so cool. Yeah, it's going to be great. All right. Thanks so much, Meg, for being our little lady in the chair. Yeah. (laughs) My pleasure. (laughs) And to everyone else, we will see you at the next webinar. We will. All right. Thank you. Have a wonderful night. Bye. Bye. Bye.